Hello and welcome to Freedom Fest TV. I'm Gina Carr and I'm the producer of Freedom Fest TV. We're so glad that you could join us today. We have an exciting uh, guest today with Jeffrey Tucker and I know you're going to be just so thrilled to hear from him. I can't wait. Every time every time Jeffrey opens his mouth, he's saying something interesting and uh, I've really enjoyed getting to know him over the last few years. Um, just an update, Freedom Fest TV, we're announcing new speakers all the time. So if you're not following us on Facebook, go to facebook.com slash the freedom Fest. You can also find it on face, uh, twitter.com slash the freedom fest. And if you aren't registered yet, please go ahead and register. Um, rates just went up, but listening to this TV show, we do have a special code we can give you and you can get a hundred dollars off your registration. So I'll be sharing that later on in the program. And with that, let me turn it over to our host, who is also the MC of Freedom Fest this year. And he was the former chief enterprise blogger for Skype. He's the he was the editor in chief for AT and T's award winning big business blog. He is um, a cer certified speaking professional and a member of the Hall of Fame of the National Speakers Association, uh, traveling all over the world speaking about marketing and technology. And I, Gina, I think you just froze up there. <laughs> Are you with us, Gina? <laughs> I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. You froze for a moment there. Okay. Well, I just said wonderful things about you. Did you not hear any of those? Oh, we heard those. Yes, indeed. And thank you. Okay. Well, take it away. All right. Well, Gina, thank you very much. And on behalf of the entire Freedom Fest team, welcome. We're glad to have you here. And I am thrilled today to have not only a person who's my friend, but a person I admire greatly. I've been reading his work. I know many of you have for a long time. His name is Jeffrey Tucker. And Jeffrey joins us, as you can see on the screen right over there. Hello, Jeffrey. Hi. Good to see you. So glad I could come. Yeah. It is good to have you here today. And now, Jeffrey, for those of you that don't know him, is a person who is an author. He's also the chief liberty uh, in executive over at liberty.me. He founded that. And he's working with the Foundation for Economic Education, one organization that leads in the field of liberty and freedom, uh, telling us that anything that's peaceful is what we can do, coming from Leonard Reed, the founder of that. Jeffrey is a person who has written a number of different books. Uh, I can't go into all of them, but Bourbon for Breakfast is one that I love, and Beautiful Anarchy, another one that I love. I encourage you, as you're watching this, write those down. Do a search. You'll really be glad you did. Uh, or Jeffrey Tucker. And uh, Jeffrey, how are you doing today? Good, good. Atlanta is looking very beautiful today. I'm in the offices of the Foundation for Economic Education, and uh, yeah, I was just I was just at lunch at a beautiful golf club and admiring this amazing combination between nature and cities, and I was just you know, life's great. So. Yeah, it's wonderful how we can have today because of the technology, because of what we've come up with and what people who are free thinkers, who are engineers, who are marketers, who do all the wonderful things in the free market, letting their minds come up with creative ways that you can enjoy work. You're there working in uh, Atlanta. You're in the Midtown area of Atlanta, aren't you? Right, that's right. And it's, it's just a beautiful city. You know, it's funny because I just got back from Washington, D.C., I guess, last weekend. And the contrast between Atlanta and Washington is so stark. Washington is just a, a, just a whole sort of dreary city of concrete and government. And, and I find the whole place a little bit oppressive and depressing and unimaginative, really. Whereas Atlanta is a city built on commerce and exchange and... Uh, diversity, um, surprise, uh, you know, there's just growth and people admire entrepreneurship here. And oh, yeah, very much so. I have to agree with you. I went to, as uh, you know, I went to school there as well, Georgia State University, yeah. uh, Concrete Campus downtown. Loved it uh, being there and seeing that. But I think it's an attribute to the free mind. And when we can think freely as individuals and the less government we have, it seems the better. Matter of fact, I think many people would agree that, you know, if government is best, which governs the least, therefore, Jeffrey, what would you see would be the logical uh, goal on that, of the government is best, which governs the least? Well, I... Uh I guess it's well known what my own view is. I don't think the state is necessary. I think we're pretty good at organizing our communities and our societies just just without all that nonsense. I think the state as an institution is a kind of mis a mistake, really. Um, but it's it's so out of control. This one mistake that we made, I don't know, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, whatever, is as in the twentieth century it became so egregious it led to you know, violent deaths and oppressions all over the world. And I would like to see the 20th century, 21st century be the time in which we begin to unravel this. And anything that promotes human liberty and diminishes the state, I'm in favor of. And as I say, all the way to zero, 
uh, would be fine with me, but I'd be glad to get back to a, a, the kind of government we had in the age of laissez-faire between the end of the Napoleonic Wars and World War I, where the state was uh, annoying, it was pillaging, it was grafting, it was just kind of trying to steal people's money to reward their friends, of course, but it didn't take your income, which would be awesome, and it didn't dictate the terms of your work, and it didn't interfere with people's professions, and it didn't erect massive barriers to, to a free association. So if we could get to that state, you know, that side of government, that size of government, I, I would be happy. Well, these yeah, and I think that's important. As a matter of fact, one of the things we want to talk about today, of course, the uh, presentation that you'll be making at Freedom Fest, you'll be talking about some things there, but also one of the uh, big uh, developments we've seen, uh, matter of fact, as we're recording this now, within the last 12 hours, we have seen some major uh, developments in the political realm. And uh, that's happening here in the United States. For those of you joining outside the United States, you're probably aware also of the election that we have this year. And my question, and the question of many people that are watching and that are tuning in that love liberty is, are we moving closer to it or are we seeing signs that the state is becoming more egregious, that it's becoming more confiscatory? And could that also then lead to further freedom when people realize how bad it is and they step back and go, oh my goodness, we certainly don't want this. So uh, because we've got you here, and uh, you're sitting there, you're uh, able to talk. We would be very interested in your opinion, your well, assessment of the world today true. as it is now, Jeffrey. Yeah, I think I think we're we're in a, the lo a long run course, which the state is really truly collapsing. It's becoming more ridiculous and more absurd all the time. And this latest political developments, which are so egregious and terrible, I think in retrospect are kind of inevitable. It's what happens when the state becomes sort of so disconnected from people's lives and so useless that it becomes ever more uh, absurd. I'm actually optimistic about this election season right now. I, I, you know, I, I've called, I was the first one to call Trump a fascist. My article appeared in News, Newsweek magazine last June. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the tradition of thought he does represent, and I don't think there's any reason to sugarcoat it. Um, his combination of, of, of uh, protectionism, nativism, and authoritarian rule, the idea that we just have to have a kind of a cult of personality at the top, that represents something real in the course of the 20th century. And he represents an attempt to sort of revive that. And, and that's what it's all about. And it's totally contrary to human liberty, his traditional thought. I don't think he's gonna win the, the general. And I think that's probably be a good thing. And the fact that he, he has won the Republican nom nomination, to me, lances a boil in some way. Uh, I think his followers are gonna be discredited at the end of this election season. And and the Republican Party is going to have to reconstitute itself on a different on a different basis, and I hope that basis is a consistent advocacy of human liberty. Something might have kicked in right there. And I think we can uh, stop that. Looks like Gina, our engineer from, by the way, from Atlanta, also Georgia Tech, uh, is uh, taking care of that. We've got Georgia Tech engineers working on this for us today. But uh, the question I was going to ask is some people are saying, yeah, but wait a minute, Trump stands up for America. He's going to protect us from those nasty foreigners that are coming in, stealing our jobs. And he's going to help us stand up and get a better deal when we're dealing with countries like Russia, China, et cetera. Uh, and many people feel that that's legitimate. Jeffrey, how would you respond? Respond to those people saying standing up for us. They've identified the wrong enemy. This is the problem. We've got a lot of problems in this country. Uh, e economic economic conditions are not good since 2008. We really haven't entered onto a growth path. Growth of one and two percent is not anything that makes anybody feel good about their lives. Obamacare really ruined the job marketplace in, in very strange ways, and so people are feeling very insecure and scared about the future. Trump comes along and says, the real problem is, is, is out there. You know, it's, it's these people called Muslims or it's Mexicans or it's, it's China, you know, the scapegoating others, that's, a, that's an old strategy. And what, what, what none of this recognizes is that the real problem people have in this country is the government. It's, it's too big, it's too intrusive, and it's messed up our lives. And, and it's done it though ever more egregiously since 2008. So I think, you know, people are looking, they know something's wrong, but they don't know what it is. Trump came along with an answer, and his answer is um, that it's everybody who's not like you, essentially. That's his message, and it's not complicated, and he wants to fix it, just like Mussolini, just like Hitler. Um, so, I, and I think this is the wrong answer. 
uh, people are right to to be to see that there's something strange going on. And I think I think Ronald Reagan had it right. He said the problem uh, the, the the problem is government essentially. And, yeah, exactly. And, and, not and the answer is the problem. Right, and uh, we don't have anybody out there in the national landscape today who's representing this position, but that doesn't make it any less true. So I think it's actually up to the advocates of human freedom to draw attention to the real, to the real sources of the problem, and 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 stop and urge people not to get distracted by this kind of scapegoating of foreigners, or for that matter, you know, you see the same thing on the left, you know, with the Bernie Sanders movement, the scapegoating of Wall Street and and wealth, as if as if you know, people getting wealthy is the problem, you know, which is not the problem, in fact. So the, our political it's actually solution. Yeah, yeah, it's a solution. We just need to broaden it out, right? Yeah. So, you know, the, this is what I mean by our politics becoming ever more absurd and irrelevant to our lives. They're not actually offering viable solutions to, to people's problems anymore. Um, where you see the real answer to our future is within the entrepreneurial sector. It's within the P2P economy, the sharing economy, uh, within the, the startup culture that I see everywhere in Atlanta. This is the way forward for jobs. What we need government to do is very simple. Just get out of the way, and then free enterprise can fix this country. Free enterprise is the way we're going to make America great again. Yeah, Milton Friedman was one that told us uh, many years ago that government usually starts with very good intention. See, here's a problem. We need to solve it. Therefore, we need a law. But it ends up with very bad results. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think Obamacare is a great example of that. There, here you have a, a group of elite intellectuals and, and powerful politicians trying to cobble together a system to widen access to health care. And they sat down at a committee, you know, and they said, okay, let's mandate wide coverage. Let's make everybody buy it. Yeah. Uh, uh, create a, a series of, of, of monopolies, uh, tie it more closely to, to business and, and make it impossible for people to, to buy catastrophic care. And they thought probably that they're expanding human rights in some way, but the effect has been exactly the opposite. It's actually yeah. diminished our rights, diminished the amount of choice that we have, and it scared the American worker to such an extent. But this was a, this is this is this this Obamacare was like a deeply catastrophic failure. And I think this is widely recognized. So I was looking at opinion polls the other day. It turns out Obamacare is less popular now than it's ever been. Mm. Uh, and, and this is just because of people's real experiences. You know, I yeah. have I have friends of mine recently who lost their jobs. And called me up and said, "Well, I'm trying to get another job, and I can't seem to get one. I guess I'm going to have to buy a catastrophic health plan, a very cheap plan that just gives me minimum coverage." And I said, "I am so sorry to let you know this, but those aren't available anymore. Obama, Obamacare changed that." And they're like, "What?" I said, "Yeah, check it out." And so they Google around. They find that these are, these plans are very expensive. You're required to buy them. The deductibles are so high that uh, one thing goes wrong in your life and you're bankrupt many times over, which is exactly what health insurance is supposed to prevent, you know? So that it's, it's caused the opposite problems. And then they have to panic. And th th then they're just looking around to take any job possible to offer them health care. Or they're considering, you know, how much is it gonna cost me to pay the fines that uh, Obamacare is imposing rather than, and, and be, go without health care. So, I mean, it's, you see what I mean? It's increased yep. the cost of everything, and it's increased worker insecurity. And as much as I, as much as I don't trust the Obama administration, I don't think that that was the intention behind the program. But that's exactly what it's done. Exactly. exactly. They start with one idea, start with certain uh, hopes and dreams, and we would agree on the problem often. We see that there are people who don't have insurance, don't have proper medical care. Hey, yeah, we want to help them. It's all in how do we do that? Do we do it through force or persuasion? I think Mark Skousen, a founder of Freedom Fest, has a very good document on that. Everything happens either via force or through persuasion. When it goes to force, government's there with good ideas, but they're using guns versus using persuasion. And it seems like that's part of the problem with Obamacare. There was a problem with medicine, but then if you roll it back even five, 10 years ago, much of the problem was because of government control and involvement yeah. in healthcare. Oh, well, that's absolutely true. I mean, that's been true since World War II. Healthcare should have yeah. never been tied 
to the businesses you work in. I mean, it really is a separate thing any more than your groceries or your tennis shoes should have been, you know, connected by law to, to where you work. So the problems really began long ago. But Obamacare took us in the opposite direction, really. And I understand sort of how it happened. You know, they, they, they thought we need more people to have more services at, at lower prices. And they thought that they could achieve that by writing this down in a document and getting Congress to pass it. But that's mm -hmm. not the way you make the world a better place, actually. Oh, it doesn't work that way. Can't we repeal the law of supply and demand? <laughs> so, you know, they, 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 they passed all these mandates and said, you know, every insurer has to offer this full range of benefits, you know, and everybody has to buy it. And they hope that, that through that they could get people with pre-existing conditions um, covered for things that were previously very expensive. But now that you've got these, this strange situation, where you have less choice in medical care, and also you have less incentive to stay healthy, which is a strange thing. Under the current conditions, and people need, really need to understand this, um, you are not rewarded for uh, for how healthy you happen to be. So, uh, so you might you might be uh, twenty three years old and doing CrossFit twice a week, um, and 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 be felt and and not a smoker or a drinker or anything else, and just be amazing. You're not going to get any better health care than somebody who's 80 years old and 300 pounds and is a and, and is an alcoholic uh, chain smoker. I mean, it makes no difference. I mean, under the current configuration, the insurance health insurance industry is not permitted to consider your health as a consideration in assessing your premiums. Now, what kind of insurance is that? I mean, that's not insurance. That's right. just that's just something else entirely. So it's it's a it's. We've, we've got a crazy system that sounds maybe good in slogans or State of the Union addresses, but in practice, it's just been a disaster. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. I think that's, I think that's the key. It looks like a good idea initially, but then later on it uh, comes back as a real problem. Well, Jeffrey, one of the things we're doing right now, as you know, we're using Blab, and Blab has the ability to do some amazing technical features and bring in people from the audience that we just love and are glad they're joining us right now. We have The Fastnick. Is that how we should refer to you, uh, uh, The Fastnick? Uh, my first name is Ian. Sir, Ian, but, well, uh, then we'll have, Ian, glad Ian. to have you on board, Ian. And uh, where are you? By the way, where are you today, Ian? I am in Southern California. Southern California, well, very good. I'm actually well, in San Bernardino. San Bernardino. Well, we're glad you could join us. And uh, matter of fact, for those of you that are joining us right now and wondering what's going on here, Ian is kind enough to join us to ask a question of Jeffrey, and we want to be able to bring in many others as well. So this is not just a, a way of us sending one-way information because Ian is gracious and kind to come on board and ask a question. We can do that as well. So Ian, I'm going to introduce you to Jeffrey. Jeffrey, Ian, uh, Ian, what is your question? Uh, Jeffrey, good day, sir. Um, I um saw you at Freedom Fest last year, and I uh, appreciated your uh, talks on Bitcoin in, uh, in the theater. Uh, so much wow. I, don't, I remember oh, yelling yeah, at yeah. That was a fun panel. I remember that. Yeah, we had a good time with, uh, what's his name, from Overstock.com. And, yeah. uh, and George on. Gilder was on the panel, too. Yeah, regardless. It was awesome. I'm looking forward to seeing you again this year um, in July. So yeah. awesome. Uh, my question for you is, is are you, have you endorsed anybody for the Libertarian Party? Um, I know we got a couple. Well, there's a bunch of people running for Libertarian Party. Uh, um, and, you know, uh, full disclosure, my guy, Austin Peterson, uh, AP for LP.com. You know, I'm, I'm pushing it. I'm, I'm a supporter of his. And um, I'm curious what you think. Um, so all three. Oh, well, I shouldn't. I guess there's like nine. There's like freaking 10 of them. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a bunch. But the top three, Gary Johnson, Austin Peterson, and John McAfee, are all friends of mine. And I think they all have something to offer. So I've decided not to. Okay. It's, not that I'm, it's not that I'm not going to say. I really don't know. I mean, um, I, John just came to my meetup in Atlanta last week and gave an awesome speech. And he was wonderful. And I hung out with him. And, and yet, two, two weeks earlier, I was with Austin. He's a very old friend and, and a wonderful guy. And I watch his hangouts all the time. I think he's been very rhetorically impressive. And I think he's running a very impressive campaign. Gary Johnson is an old friend, and I really admire him. I think they all kind of bring something to the table. And I, it's really an impossible question for me. I guess I'm feeling like I, I hope the delegates you know, at the LP have a better sense of this than I do. I'm going to be there if you're going. But... Oh, nice. I'm not able to make it. I wish I could. Um, that's so I'm, Freedom Fest over the, the over Libertarian Convention. 
I, you know, I, yeah, I'm going to vote, but, um, but I guess I feel like whoever gets a nomination is going to be so much better than, you know, the Republicans or the Democrats. That I, I yeah, I just hope we can all unify. Like, if you follow some of the Facebook groups and all of the, you know, man, libertarians, butt heads. I know, um, right? <laughs> um, I hope that we, whoever it is, we can unify behind him. Um, uh, I like Austin. He, he's got that fire. He's got that passion. And I'd like to see him on the stage with Clinton and Trump and just, you know, the one, two freaking haymaker in the face to those two yeah. knuckleheads. You know what I mean? Well, and Austin's been very good about the use of technology, I have to say. I mean, his social... Well, yeah, I mean, it's all grassroots, right? He doesn't yeah. have any, I mean, you know, as far as mainstream media, um, I know Gary... Oops, we got... We froze. Oh, we just froze? Mm-hmm. And something's going on there. Well, I think what he was saying is uh, we've got uh, the three different candidates. And uh, I think from the Libertarian point of view, I'm not a member of the Libertarian Party. And Freedom Fest, of course, is not endorsing any one particular candidate. But I will say this. All three of the top runners that you talked about have been invited to be on a blab and talk to us before the Libertarian Convention, which will take place at the end of this month. And so, uh, Ian, if you're still watching this, if you're able to get it, sorry for the technical issues. I don't know what happened there. But uh, please let uh, Austin know, since you know him, uh, that he is most cordially invited. We'd want to have them on one at a time individually, so it's not uh, uh, three of them competing against each other, and talk and express their views on whatever issue they might want. So I think that will be uh, very good. What do you think of the election this year? Jeffrey, I want to just kind of cut to the chase here. Today's an important day. We saw, uh, as we're recording this now, as we're broadcasting this, we've seen uh, uh, Ted Cruz drop out. Out of the race, Oops, no, we as got we're to... recording this right now, there are rumors that John Kasich will also drop out if he hasn't already since we just started this. I'm not uh, up to it uh, currently, but it could happen. Jeffrey, what's your take on uh, what's going on and where we stand in the political front? Well, <clears throat> I, I, you know, as I mentioned, I'm, I, I actually think it's a good thing that Trump uh, is going to win the nomination, even though I oppose everything he stands for. Uh, partially, I think the the Republican establishment needed. Uh, Needed a wake-up call, mm -hmm. and um, and needed to reassess its rhetorical and ideological commitments. And I think the cool thing about Trump, in a way, is that he's sort of the the least libertarian Republican we've had in my in my lifetime, and that's not a bad thing, actually, because I th I think it could end up that um, that it'll 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 wake up a lot of Republicans to consider what it is we really believe in. I mean, are we, are we really going to endorse nativism, fascism, uh, you know, racism as, as an ideology, or are we going to start rallying around freedom? So I think, the, I think the next time around, the Republican candidates are going to be better. So, and I, I'm, not, I'm not a big voter, obviously. I, and in fact, I've not followed politics for years until 2015. Um, and wow. What a what a shock it's been to see this whole thing transpire. Uh, you know, yeah, so. exactly. Now, I want to address some of the comments that have come in. One of the beauties of using Blab and being able to have live comments come in. Jeffrey, some of the people are saying, well, now, wait a minute, you're getting it wrong here. Trump is not a racist. He just like dislikes illegal immigrants and people that are coming in. And he wants an uh, emphasis on illegal. If they're legal coming in, then it's perfectly fine. How would you answer those that hold that position? Uh, well, I think that position is extremely naive. If you know somebody about American politics, you know about about dog whistles, and he's done more than than talk about dog whistles. I mean, he's talking about you know banning Muslims, you know, from coming to this country. He's praised the Japanese internment camps, and he's got even gone further. I mean, you know, F, F, he praised FDR for banning Germans from using radios uh, and and flashlights and things like that during World War II. I mean, this guy, you know, this guy has, has celebrated the, the most a racialist based statism of the 20th century and he thinks it's all just awesome if you read some of the literature uh, of a century ago when eugenics was really popular he, he speaks just like these guys it's the same it's the same kind of nonsense it's no different mm -hmm. yeah so, okay I, mean, I think he knows exactly what he's he's doing um and he's unleashed a kind of uh forces in american political life that it, have usually shut up, but are now feeling very much empowered based on, on uh, I think, racial solidarity and resentment against the other, which, as I say, is not surprising. It's sort of the same kind of stuff you get in, in any economic recessions. People are looking for, for, um, for scapegoats.
And yeah, they're looking for the scapegoat. Well, we saw a lot of that, of course, vividly years ago in Germany when uh, some nasty things happened to select groups of people. And speaking of Europe, we have Fabrizio, who is joining us on the screen right now. Fabrizio, hey. thanks for being here today. Hi, everybody. Yeah, I'm, call I'm calling in from the UK. I've also lived in Italy 20 years, uh, my father being Italian um, and I was educated internationally. So I've lived around the world, worked with many different nationalities. Now, I don't agree with Jeffrey on this 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 way Trump's going against. I don't think Trump is a racist. Uh, let's look at Europe right now. We've got this problem with these refugees, and I agree there are some of these refugees which are genuine, and they do need help, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But unfortunately, there are a lot of these refugees that are coming in that are actually not refugees. I mean, if we look at the geography of Syria and, and that part of the world, why are these people being trekked all the way from Syria, all the way over to Germany, the UK, Italy, France, and that, when they could be going to Saudi Arabia, which is next door? And guess what? Saudi Arabia's got the same weather, the same language, the same culture, the same religion. Why are they coming to England where it rains and everyone speaks English? Uh, so, you know, when Trump's going on about we've got to look at Europe and see what's happening there, we are being invaded here. The crime rate has gone through the roof and it's only going to get worse. And I'm only hoping and praying on the 23rd of June here in England that the English people turn around and vote. Let's get out of the EU before yeah, we become part of the union. Remember, once upon a time, there used to be a thing called the Soviet Union. So yeah. we've got to be careful now on, on the stance what's happening in America. You've got a lot of people that can just walk over the border. And it costs money to get a green card. And I've tried before in the past. My father almost had a green card years ago when we used to live in the States. Um, it's not easy for somebody that wants to legally immigrate to the United States. And it also costs a lot of money. So why let people just walk across the border from Mexico and come in for free? Okay, Fabrizio, right. thank you. Thank you for that. Very good points. And Jeffrey, you might have heard these before. We're hearing that. What you, Fabrizio, what you're saying is echoed by a lot. Jeffrey, how would you answer uh, Fabrizio and others that are making those uh, those? Uh, well, because again, here in Europe, we've got a major problem, and it's going to happen in the U.S. too. So learn from our mistakes. Right, Jeffrey. Uh, I agree with you about playing out of the EU. If I were if I were a UK citizen, I would I would vote on leaving the union uh, immediately. Um, so I'm completely with you on that, and uh, mainly because I think I believe in political decentralism and, and not not yeah. regulation. And, yeah. and I don't right. I don't think that UK should be uh, forced to accept uh, immigrants that they they don't want. So I mean that that's just a recipe for political disaster, really. Europe does have a massive immigration problem, um, but I don't I don't you know, the problem with Europe is that it's it's not economically. Uh, institutionally structured to to absorb immigration. I mean, so many immigrants are unemployed. They have no uh, job opportunities. They they can't start businesses, and this is because of, of massive bureaucracies. I mean, this is what what bred that disaster in Belgium, really. But it's well, been socialism. Well, the problem is with Europe. The biggest problem is this European Community, which initially started off as, has become a European Union, and socialism is the biggest movement in Europe. And maybe some Europeans don't like to hear that word, but that's the reality. And Brussels is creating more and more regulation, which is driving business people like myself away. I'm moving to Canada in a few months time, Good. British Columbia, <laughs> where I had a meeting with a local uh, government business people. And they said, we have created laws here to help entrepreneurs create wealth. Yeah. That's a great, that's exactly what I want to hear. I'll bring my millions over to you. Yeah. Um, and yeah. simple, simple as that. But Canada is also accepting a lot of uh, Syrian refugees. And one of the reasons they are is that they have a business climate that allows people to get jobs, start businesses, and integrate themselves into a normal communities. I mean, Europe is so shut down at this point uh, from with regulatory controls and socialism that once you create a world like that, yeah, you can't, you can't take immigrants in. What are they going to do? They have nowhere to work, where to go. You have sometimes nowhere to live. And then they just live in these ghettos and they breed terrorism and the, the other thing is these people and having lived in a Muslim country and worked for them for two and a half years, um, they function in a very different way. There is no way and here in England they say, oh, they will integrate into they're not going to integrate. They do not integrate. They will come here and they will demand that we live according to their law and not the other way around. If you're coming to England and you don't like what we do here, leave. You shouldn't be here. Yeah, but here's the problem. I mean, if we had the right kind of societies that were based on freedom, it would be very much like the 19th century in the United States. And we had, you know, in the 19th century, we had, this country had no immigration controls whatsoever to anybody yeah. in the world. And, but we had a free economy. So uh, it worked. I mean, it worked beautifully. Yeah. And, and, and here we are in the 21st century, and we're, we're confused why immigration has become a, a problem. Well, the, the reason is, 
that we we have the wrong kind of systems. Yeah, and they're highly regulated. U.S. is is much better than the U.K. as far as I understand it. Um, what I would like to see, rather than cracking down on the borders and policing our businessmen and 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 having immigration control, you know, invade our homes, find out if we're hiding immigrants and and all the rest of it. Rather than that direction, I'd like to see uh, uh, where where we're permitted to hire and fire who we want, where people can start businesses, where people can get jobs. I think that's a better answer than. than well, I'll let you, I'll let you in on something that not many people know about, but I invite anybody that's listening to this to to look into it. The UK, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada are about to sign an agreement to to allow people to move freely amongst these countries because they're all Commonwealth nations. Yeah. They all speak. And so this bill is actually being discussed now with politicians in the UK, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. And I think if on the 23rd of June, the UK opt out of the European Union, this law is going to be passed a lot quicker because obviously all these Polish and, and Spanish people that are here in England will have to leave the next day because they won't have a work visa. Who's going to replace them? New Zealanders, Australians and Canadians. Um, but they all speak English. So, you know, it's going to be – and this thing with Commonwealth countries should have happened many years ago. The biggest problem with Europe is that we have 34 different countries that speak 34 different languages. They eat 34 different types of food at the dinner table uh, in the evenings, and you're never going to get them to agree because they're all very different. So let them uh, – let them, let's say celebrate their diversity. Let's just open the, 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 the business so that we can freely trade with each other. Uh, as you said before, Jeffrey, the reason why America worked back in the 19th century is because immigration, anybody could move there, but then anybody could set up any business and trade with anybody. That's right. Yeah, that's and, right. And the, too, and the yeah. too much regulation kills kills any business. Yeah. Well, and, and also the other thing is that that you can't actually have a single nation with many, many different languages like Europe's trying to do right now. This is yeah. an unviable. So it's never going to work. No, it's an unviable project. It was all based on, on, on a kind of a crazy utopianism. I mean, the strange thing is that like in the late Middle Ages, Europe was Europe. Europe. I mean, it really was an integrated, unified country, but not not under a single control. It was unified because it was unified in the idea of freedom. You know, so yeah. so uh, I mean, even the 18th century. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's funny. I mean, you think back at it. I mean, a, a composer like Handel could be born in Germany, make a career in Italy, make his way to England compose all the oratorios to define a nation. But that's the way people were. People lived like like internationally. So there was a certain kind of unity, but it was it was a unity in in, in a principle of freedom. It wasn't a centrally planned Brussels imposed bureaucracy. And so anytime you do you can ruin any country centralization. I mean, this is, I think, the core problem in the US. You know, we well I mean the, the best immigration policy I've seen so far is the Australian one. Basically, anybody can go to Australia on a work slow, on a holiday slash work visa for one year. You go there, you find a job, you work for a year. If at the end of the year your employer likes you, they write a letter and you get a permanent visa. That's that gives everybody from anywhere in the world the opportunity to go over there and prove themselves. And if they deliver value to the marketplace, someone will write a sponsorship letter and they're in. And, but and, you know, and if, in the U.S. now, you can't even employ people from, from foreign countries. I mean, you talk about people coming across the border. I'm telling you. This country has practically shut down immigration to the point that it's tragic, actually. I mean, like, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm hiring for jobs all the time. I, I can't even consider uh, hiring people from outside the, outside the U.S. for these jobs. So you end up having to work digitally. Uh, yeah, but you should, you, yeah, but you should be able to, you see. And that's why if, yeah. you, if you have the immigration uh, – I mean, I don't agree with these people just walking across the border because I've got friends of mine that live in the U.S. now. They spent a lot of money in legal fees to get a green card. OK, right. and they studied, they went to university in the States, they spent money and it's not right towards them that someone can just go to Mexico and just walk across yeah. the border and they're in. That's it's right. not right. Fabrizio, Fabrizio, excuse me for interrupting, but we appreciate what you're saying. You're raising some very good points and really glad you could be with us, Sarah. It's, uh, I know it's a little bit late. What about uh, seven o'clock or so your time? Seven thirty four. Yes, seven thirty four. But thank you for joining us. And it looks like we have someone else joining us right now, a General Abel, who's looking Bye, out the window of it yeah. looks like a car. Fabrizio, I'll see you a little bit later. And uh, General Abel, uh, can you hear us on the screen there? Yes, I can. Uh, good after, Good morning. It's it's eleven thirty eight in San Diego. Good morning. Well, good morning, and uh, San Diego. I guess you're driving live down the road, Jeffrey. Have you ever had this before in all your uh, on live video? We've got someone with the car driving down the road. <laughs> Just not seen. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, well, let me tell you this. 
Should we call Let you Joe or uh, Mr. Abel, or how would you like us to refer to you? Uh, either or. Either or. Okay. Well, then, General, uh, what is your question for Jeffrey Tucker? Well, you know what? Uh, you know, you know. I just got in here. I read. I read your heading. I, I believe you, uh, I heard a little bit what you guys are talking about. It's, it's extremely interesting. I wish I was here earlier. I just want to say, Southern California, California in general, is going Trump. I'm telling you, Trump is going to win California. Believe it. Trump is going to take over all the southern states. We want the change. We want our jobs back. We want our. We want uh, protected borders. We want our Second Amendment rights. We want it all. I'm telling you, there's, there's, there's a movement, a revolution going on in America, and we're going Trump. I'm okay. telling you, hop on the train, get your, get your ticket. Okay. Who's on board? Well, get on the Trump Joe, train. I appreciate your comment. Uh, Jeffrey, what are your, uh, is your response? I'm curious, what, what do you think is going to be the results of this, uh, of this Trump movement? Well, well, you know what? Uh, nothing is promised, but, but you, know, you know, the things, uh, the, the policies that Trump represents, I understand he, if, if Trump becomes president, I understand he's going to have a hard time trying to implement, implement the policies that he is promising to the American people. But as long as the American people stand behind Trump, he will have a successful term as, as, as our, what, 46th, 47th president? Yeah, but what's he, what, I'm, gonna ask you, 40, I'm just asking you, what's he, what's he going to do and what are you hoping for? He's going to bring the jobs back. He's going to bring the jobs back. He's going to bring our factories, all, our economy back. He's gonna he's gonna uh, fix uh, all of our bad deals with with all the foreign nations uh, you know of the earth. He's gonna he's gonna he's gonna uh, 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 get rid of NAFTA, get rid of the TTP uh, 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 trade uh, agreement that they're trying to come up with. You, you know you know all those all those unfair uh, trade agreements that that the evil crony uh, capitalists have uh, have have created with you know all the Asian European African nations. And, and you know South American nations, he's going to get rid of all of that. And you know what? Trump is a businessman. He's he's made billions of dollars all around the world. He knows how to make money. He knows how to how to make deals. How to make you know you know how to negotiate. He's the right man. Okay, General, I think. We, I mean, his resume. General, I think says get your idea, all. Jeffrey. Uh, your response. Um. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I don't. I don't think. I don't think the the, um, the economy is going to be fixed with with um, with a with a strong executive. I think it's going to be fixed through um, a freer free economy. And I, I I don't I don't see protectionism as 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 a path towards freedom. And I I actually, I'm really I'm really worried about people who who believe all of this stuff because I'm so sorry that it's incredibly untrue. Can I, can, I, can, I, can I please call you? Jeffrey, look. Jeffrey, look. People like me, the reason why we believe... Trump, Trump just didn't just miraculously come up with all these ideas. These are ideas that have been in the heart of mind of Americans for a very long time. This is what we want. We want to get rid of the, all those bad agreements and NAFTA. We want to get rid of all this deficit, deficit all this, all this uh, deficit trade. All this, all this economic class war. We want to get rid of all that. And Trump is the only man who has stood up in front of the whole world and said what, and, and has actually said on a microphone what the American people want. This is not Trump's plan. This is, this is, this is the plan of the American people. And Trump is the reason why people love Trump. This, this billionaire Hollywood guy, this random guy, right? That nobody, that, that everybody. That General, I think you're running into another area. You're moving along there. You're going outside of a good cell range. Years. Listen, uh, Jeffrey, I'm sorry for talking. Uh, I'm sorry for talking a lot. Young man, a young first generation American. For years, I've been yelling and hooting and hollering. I, I'm just one voice, but for years I've been yelling. <clears throat> am, 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 I, am I loud and clear, guys? Am I here? You guys are blacking out. You're, you're coming through okay, but uh, if you could just uh, have a letter with a final question, and then we can go. We've got some other calls that have some questions as well. Right, right, right. Well, well, my last comment was for years. I've been, I've been, you know, people have been yelling. What, what are we doing with this economy? Why are we dealing with the deficit? Why are we, why is our, why are we proceeding with, with the way our economy is? We don't have a free economy. It's being ran by crony capitalist uh, 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 ways, a, a, a crony capitalist system. It's not a free economy. Are you kidding me? A free economy, Jeffrey? I don't know what you do, or, or you know, you know, you're, you're a grown man. I'm sure you have more expertise and wisdom than I do as a young man. But but this is what we need, and you know what? 
the Trump Trump is a phenomenon because he's kept, he's come out of nowhere and has spent his own billion you know money to say what the American people want, and this is why majority of the American people want him, and this is why the whole media and all the corporations and all the crony capitalists are going against Trump. This is why they're afraid General, of Trump. General, this is why General, can you hear me? Trump General, is a racist. General, General, can you hear me? Thank you very much. We appreciate yes, you. We've got some thank other you, callers that are asking. So uh, thank you. But I'm going to uh, turn it over and have Jeffrey thank, give us a good response. Thank you very much Trump, for joining us. Trump 2016. Really appreciate what you're saying. I think that would be good. Get on the Trump so, train. Jeffrey, what, what would be your response uh, to that? Because I know he expresses the view of many people. Well, you know, it's not, I mean, this is a cult of personality. And I think that last caller sort of illustrates this. And I, I think it's actually really sad. Uh, and and really very tragic, actually. Um, one specific thing that he, he he kept mentioning was the, the the deficit. You know, this this idea that there's a deficit on trade. Um, I hope we understand what that what that means. I mean, the trade deficit is in a, 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 it's not actually money anybody owes us. What this is is an accounting fiction uh, based on the relationship between imports and exports from a pr particular country. So you can rack up a, a deficit. If you're buying more from, I don't know, Mexico, then Mexico's, you know, buying from, from you. Uh, but it's not money that is owed to anybody in particular. As I say, this is just an accounting uh, fiction. Uh, deficit is not the right term for it. I have a deficit in that sense with Chick-fil-A because I buy more uh, chicken sandwiches from them than they buy from me. In fact, it's a hundred percent deficit. <laughs> yeah, and, and, they haven't bought uh, much from you uh, lately at all, have they? No, right. They have and a terrible and, deficit yeah. with Chick Fil A. Right, and so to take away my right to buy a chicken sandwich doesn't actually improve my life. And Trump's in a similar way to take away Americans' rights to 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 buy Mexican products is not going to improve this young man's life. I'm so sorry to say. So um, this is exactly what I find so disgusting about and truly disgusting and repulsive about Trump is that he's lying to people and naive people who are upset about the state of the economy are, 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 are looking to him to improve their lives, that they yeah. are believing an illusion. It, it is not going to work. Yep. They're going to yep. surrender, surrender their freedom to uh, to a megalomaniac who knows nothing apparently about economics, or if he does, he doesn't want to. He is manipulating millions of people in this country, and that caller is a great example of precisely the kind of person who's being lied to and manipulated. Yeah, Jeffrey, let me interrupt you there and uh, ask something very important. I want to go even deeper than this, because often I've seen in my life since I get a chance to talk with you, a person I really admire, and I know you have your uh, degree in economics and also understand history a lot. We see this uh, a lot throughout history. I want to go beyond just the current issue with Trump here in the United States. Throughout history, we've often seen people say, this one guy, if we can get him in power, we elect this guy or we bring him to power, throw out these other rascals and bring this person in, we'll go marching into the Garden of Eden. Or everything will be great if this one guy comes in. I want to ask you, why do you think we lean that way? And uh, how can we help people that seriously believe, like uh, the gentleman that was joining us, General Abel, on that seriously believe one guy, this one guy, will take care of it for us, that we've seen this kind of thing happen? Well, and also, you notice the way he's already built in excuses for him, right? So yeah. I said, what's he going to do? He said, well, I don't know. He faces a lot of barriers. He probably won't be able to get done what he would. So, so right if he fails, people are going to blame every, everybody but Trump. You know, so you've already got that sort of bank, baked into it. Um, we have to understand that Trump is promising something that's fundamentally un-American, actually. We've never really had anybody running for president who's, who's promised to become basically the CEO of the entire country, you know? I mean, we've had people like Ross Perot in the past who, who thought that through authoritarian dictate he could run the government, which is by itself absurd. I mean, we so presumably America has a, a constitutional system with three three branches that are supposed to check each other. We don't elect dictators in this country, but Trump has gone one step further, or many steps further down this line. He's not just promising to be the dictator of a of the of a of a government, but he's he's promising me to to be the autocratic central planner of the entire American economy. Um, you know, doing all these trade deals with every, with every country, uh, determining 
what the economic structures are, are going to look like. I mean, he wants to run America the way he runs uh, Trump Tower, essentially. And this is a fallacy. It's rooted in socialistic principles. It's proven to be a failure throughout the whole of the 20th century. And people who are going for it are going to be seriously disillusioned. I mean, this kind of attitude that Trump is, is, is pushing out there has led many countries to utter and total ruin. This is my fear. Uh, by the way, the first time I heard Trump speak was actually, of all places, at Freedom Fest itself. And I'm very grateful to, uh, to Mark Skousen for having brought him there because if yes. he hadn't done that, I would not have understood uh, what was going on in this country and, and who Trump was. So I'm, I'm very grateful to him for that. He had issued an invitation to all the Republican candidates to come. And I guess if Marco Rubio accepted and maybe Trump and maybe that was it. But I'm very grateful to that because I sat there and watched in an audience of, I don't know how many people were there, you know, 1,500 people or something like that. Um, most everybody was against him, but I saw the way he was able to even manipulate some of the attendees of that conference into believing the oldest myths about trade, that somehow if you cut off trade with foreign countries, that'll make your country richer. It doesn't. It makes prices for everything go higher and reduces job opportunities, and reduces the division of labor and reduces wealth. You can drive an economy into a, a deeper depression through protectionism, yet that's what, he, that's what, that's what Trump is promising. I mean, Trump is promising to, to make America great again through a dictatorship and, and, and shutting down of freedom itself. And that is, uh, you know, the this, this opposite of everything I ever, uh, uh, that economics has ever taught us and the opposite from everything I've ever stood for in my life. So. Uh, the tragedy of, of people like the color we just had, you know, he sees the fallacy in somebody like like Bernie Sanders, right, or or Hillary Clinton, but but he's blinded, probably most likely, uh, through identity politics, and through a sheer act of faith, but you know, by by the Trump campaign, he doesn't see socialism when it comes in a right wing package. Essentially, that's that's the problem, and in that sense. I think Trump is a, is is an even a, a bigger danger represents an even a bigger danger to human liberty than than many people on the left. Yeah, and I think those of you that are watching this, you get a chance to see that this is what Freedom Fest is all about. It's about sharing ideas. Sometimes we have disagreements on uh, things, and we're able to talk about these in a respectful, peaceful way. And I think that's more needed now than ever before. And uh, Freedom Fest, of course, is coming up this July, and you want to make sure that you get a chance to uh, be there. Register for this now. It, to me, is an intellectual feast. And uh, what I want to do also is, Jeffrey, have you talk just a little bit. Tell us about what you're going to discuss at Freedom Fest, another topic that relates to freedom, people living their lives their way. And that is the idea of uh, legal drinking age, which we sometimes think about. But if we're not in that, it doesn't affect us. But well, legal drinking right. age and that. Tell you've been doing some study on that. What are some of the? I some hardly the anybody talks about. That. Hardly anybody talks about this subject. And yet, it's profoundly important for young people. You know, we send people off to college. We say, "Don't drink until you're 21 years old." Well, guess what? They do. So the very first thing that people do is they try to get uh, fake IDs. They get them confiscated. They get, get a half a dozen fake IDs in the course of their college experience. They, they learn that the way to drink is to hide out in dormitories and in frat houses and, and not in commercial space, space, spaces where there's adult behavior going on. And so you've got this age group that's you know famously irresponsible and, and where you've imposed upon them a culture of prohibition. And it's led to vast amounts of alcohol abuse on campus, uh, binge drinking and, and blacking out and pre-gaming and this whole culture of, of outrageous levels of, of, of abuse. That, that's having the spinoff effects, really, uh, during formative years in people's lives. And I think it's just been uh, disastrous for, for America's youth. And we've been doing this now for, I guess, since 1985, so going on 30 years now, and it's, and it's, and it's a failure. And, and you're right that people don't talk about it, especially people most affected by it, because they're too busy sneaking around. They don't want to talk about it. Yeah, exactly. They're not supposed to be doing it, so where would they go? Right. So this is why I think it's important for, for, for people who can drink already uh, and why I'm speaking out so, so strongly about the topic, because I think we need to reassess all this stuff. The U.S. has the highest drinking age laws in, in the world outside of places like Azerbaijan and, you know, other, you know, 
um, fundamentalist countries. Uh, but it was a place like Australia, and there's many other countries in, in the UK, um, where you're able to drink wine and beer by the age of 16 and liquor by 18. I think that's a very good standard. Um, and I think it's a rational standard. And, and it's something that helps young people learn how to become responsible drinkers rather than acculturate them in, in, a, in, a, in a world of, of abuse and um, really sometimes you know, great danger. Uh, and, and in saying this, I'm not disagreeing with, with what many college presidents and chancellors in this country have already said, these laws are not working. And um, they, they favor a repeal, but so far there's been very little movement in this country. I guess like two states are considering, I think California is considering lowering the drinking age and I, I, it, it needs to be done sooner rather than later. As I say, for the sake of, of young people, so we can end this culture. I mean, if you, you just have to think about it. We all know what happened in alcohol prohibition in the 1920s. It led to poisonings, um, uh, massive law breaking, violence, uh, all sorts of distortions of the culture and the society and economic life. And fortunately, we we're wise enough to finally repeal that in 1933, I guess it was, finally. FDR, that was one of his first acts. In fact, this is a major reason why a lot of people voted for FDR, is that he was the, he was the, he was the candidate who promised to repeal the prohibition, which is fascinating. Mm -hmm. I don't remember this. but So now I think we need that same kind of movement to get rid of prohibition for, for young people in, in college today. And I think it'll, it'll change the culture, get people back to learning and studying, behaving like adults, rather than uh, prolonging their childhood in this in this, this swamp of alcoholism and binge drinking that's been going on in this country now for decades. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. One of the things, one of the things that, that I appreciate, that I appreciate about what you what talk about, about is that you show, show the possibilities the of real development and living life as uh, free people. I know you're going to go much more in depth on this at Freedom Fest, be able to tell us even more. And so those of you that uh, want to learn more about this and wouldn't just be around Jeffrey Bohr, you definitely want to look into registering for Freedom Fest. But I want to go back to some of the things that you've talked about that have really helped me, Jeffrey. You've helped me to look at the positive side. Too often, people who believe in a free market, believe in uh, people having liberty and freedom, We our conversations become negative. Oh, the government's doing this. Oh, did you hear what they're doing over in East Wakahuga about this or that? And we know how terrible it is. But very the things, to be a libertarian. You're so right about that. Yeah. Oh, bad. <laughs> yeah, it's always bad. But the thing is, I really appreciate, I remember at Freedom Fest last year, you really helped me a lot. I was sitting there taking notes on my uh, device and typing away on my little iPad and notes about the great things and the opportunities now for freedom and liberty that you talked about, I think it was uh, like you mentioned, a condo, if you have the homeowners association and how they can be some kind of a uh, government for you, but how to peacefully and legally be able to extract yourself from a lot of that and just really enjoy life. Tell us a little bit about that. While well, we got you here, about the benefits of living life fully and f with freedom and liberty, even in the midst of our society. Well, one thing is I think people need to stop paying such close attention to politics. I mean, if you do that, it's going to eventually drag you down uh, because politics is always and everywhere depressing. I mean, it's just awful. And if you paid attention in 2015, you'll, you'll see that's true. But once you look outside the political realm and look at, at entrepreneurship and, and technology and just the way people are living their lives, we're seeing the world become a freer place um, every day with ever more tools to, uh, as you say, sort of separate yourself from the political system. And there's many, many things you can do in your own life to, to live a freer life. It's harder now than it's ever been. But in fact, you see people doing it every day. Um, and I think it's uh, tremendously inspiring, actually. Uh, the other thing that's very interesting about the technology that we, where we're using nowadays, it's necessarily globalized and it and exists in the realm of digital media that government has very little permission to, uh, ability to control. We have permissionless communication going on all over the world. So we're seeing this kind of free world being gradually built mm, and we're yeah. seeing the systems that the state constructed over the course of the 20th century uh, fail from healthcare to education to transportation systems foreign policy you name it fiscal systems nothing's working very well um, i'm a fan of thomas kuhn's work on the history of science and what he teaches is that when when there's too many anomalies to a prevailing system that that uh, to a prevailing paradigm that paradigm is going is under pressure and it could actually, in fact, collapse. And I think that's what we're going to see over the next 10 years, is the idea of government control is going to become ever more discredited.
Yeah, I think so. I think in a way, I look back and, uh, as I grew up, we were fighting in this place that I didn't understand. I remember getting the paper one day as a little kid. Let's just learn to read. And I came and I asked my dad, I said, Dad, what does V-I-E-T spell? And he says, is there an N-A-M after that? I said, yeah, because I was just learning the alphabet. And he said, oh, that's Vietnam. That's where we're stopping communism over there rather than it coming here. And of course, now years later, we look back at that and we think, what happened as a result of that? Vietnam today is becoming even more free market. And in some ways, we could say that it's better. Do you think that the yeah. collapse yeah. of socialism... Well, of and now they have a vibrant stock market and it's a, a freer economy probably than the U.S. <laughs> yeah, so the, we, we went and we fought in an unfortunately terrible tragedy. We lost 58,000 American lives and many, many others from other countries as well, all to stop the communists. And now they have many, much more freedom. Do you think that socialism and the government control, the authoritarianism, the fascism, all of this that we're seeing can eventually implode upon itself? I think it can. I mean, we have to remember that most of these systems that have been so egregious and pillaging of American liberties, they really began about 100 years ago, maybe like 105 years ago or something like that. But the whole system, say, central banking and income taxes, regulation of everything from education, med medical care to legal professions to, to zoning laws, you name it. It was all brought about in the, in the so-called progressive era, right? So be somewhere between 1908 and, and, and 1920. And uh, and those all those laws still exist, but they were an anomaly in history, uh, very much so. And they, I don't think it's sustainable. I think it's a, it was a tremendous mistake, and those mistakes are being revealed to us more and more. Um, and people are very frustrated with it. The problem is people don't always know why this is happening. You know, I feel sorry for some of these callers we've had. You know, saying, you know, blaming the Chinese or the Mexicans. You know, guess what, guys? Our problems are a lot closer to home. They all live within the beltway of Washington, D.C. It's yep. the political class and the permanent bureaucratic class and the laws and the books and the regulations that are ruining your life. It's not, you know, Pakistanis and, 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 and Chinese and, and Filipinos that are, that are your problem. Your problem is your own politicians and the bureaucrats that, uh, that they employ. That's, yeah. what we to, to, that's what we need to target. If we could have a free economy... Uh, most of these problems will go away. Yep. A free economy tends to erode. When you think about it, we don't need government telling us something very important in our life, like who are we going to be with? Who, would your, who will your partner be, your spouse, your mate? And you think, whoa, that's important. Shouldn't we have a government committee deciding who's going to be there to make sure it's done right? Well, of course not. It'd be repulsive to do that. We well, can make these decisions on our own. And you, you mentioned, uh, since you mentioned that, Another example of laws that were universalized in the progressive era were these marriage license laws, mostly done for eugenic reasons. Our government decided they had to control a breeding in the population. They thought that the way to do that was, was by marriage licenses. So you had to ask the government for permission to marry somebody for the first time. And we've seen what that's done. Give her time. I mean, the, 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 Uh, the things that we can probably see. and I love your comments on this. Also, the other Forget a lot of members.
Então, 